Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger, and welcome to Dare to Dream. Wow. People. I'm so excited about today's talk because last year when Mark Anthony, the psychic lawyer, was on my show and we concluded, and you can go back and listen to that from last year, we were about to end and he realized how much into UFOs and extraterrestrials I am. And he said, hey, why don't we do a show next July to honor World UFO Day? And here we are finally doing it. And I've been looking forward to this, to hearing what he knows, his perspective. This is an award-winning, best-selling author, and he has performed readings, sessions for people who are abducted multiple times by UFO aliens and their experience. So thanks for joining us today. It's going to be a great show. Dare to Dream has been winning a lot of awards lately. There's three Talk Positive Radio Awards, the COVR Award for Best Radio Podcast, Welp Magazine named Dare to Dream, one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. And I could go on and on, but I thank you guys so much. I read everything you write, by the way. So please keep subscribing, keep liking, keep commenting. It You help me, you help the show. And really who you help is those I serve because the folks who want to find this program, it's a matrix, right? And they've all got them, Spotify, YouTube, all of them. They look for that. So the more you do it, the more you bring this information, these guests, these conversations in front of people who are really hungering to hear this information and learn these things. As a reminder, I thank Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness for their energy work out in the world. They sponsor this show. If you would like to find out more, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com and look them up. I am a book writing coach and I also work with authors to take their books to guaranteed international bestseller. And I do publicity work for a handful of usually pretty well-known spiritual messengers. I love doing what I do and who I connect with. And to honor today's subject, I've got a free gift for you. It's a star seed report and video. So if you'd like to find out more about your galactic origins, your galactic lineage, go to galacticshaman.com slash get free gift. And no worries, I'm gonna have the link in the show notes. It's a two hour video breaking down 14 star seeds, their origins, their gifts, their purpose, 21 page star seed report, and we deep dive into 19 star seeds. So you'll find your galactic origins there. It's mind blowing information. It is from me to you, a cosmic digital gift. And with gratitude that you are here today. So my guest back again, Mark Anthony, JD Psychic Explorer, also known as the Psychic Lawyer, is a fourth generation psychic medium. He communicates with spirits. He is an Oxford educated attorney. Mark appears nationwide on TV and radio. He also co hosts the live stream show, The Psychic and the Doc, on Transformation Network. This psychic explorer travels to mystical locations in remote corners of the world to examine ancient mysteries and supernatural phenomena. Mark is a featured speaker at conferences, expos, and universities, and Mark Anthony is the author of three best-selling books, his latest, The Aftermath, Frequency. He is also a VIP executive contributor for Best Holistic Life magazine. And if you'd like to find out more about him or get on his mailing list and see his events, go to afterlifefrequency.com. And with that, I welcome the amazing Mark Anthony back to Dear to Dream. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Debbie. It's, o- it's always fun working with you. We always have a really good time. Indeed. And I think it turns out that today is very auspicious that we're doing this. I don't know if you realize, but today is called the day out of time, right? It is the final day of the Mayan calendar. And day out of time, for those who don't know, is the culmination of the 13 moon calendar 
year that was originated from the Mayan science of time. And today is July 25th, which represents Sirius, the dog star. And that's when it rises with the sun. So this day is observed as a day free of time in the 13 moon calendar. Amazing. That's really, that's really awesome. And the Mayans, I, I do a presentation called Mayan Star People of the Jungle. Mm -hmm. Because the Mayans, and I was in Central America, and I was studying a couple different Mayan sites. Their knowledge of astronomy and astrology, mathematics, I mean, sophisticated calculations, is just, it's beyond impressive. And, and it's really sad when we get this, you know, European American attitude towards cultures outside of the United States and Europe as being primitive and somewhat backwards. Because when you go into Mayan ruins, and you see how they built the pyramid at Chichen Itza, plus several of the other sites at Tulum and Debanche and Cajunlish, without metal tools, that it just blow your mind. Then a few years back, I was in Hawaii and we were filming a project there and I was working with um, the Lapu, the Hawaiian priests of the, their ancient religion. And their heiaus, which are their temples, are these open air. Um, basically, they're like little walls that they make of, of stone, <clears throat> usually volcanic rock. And they don't look very elaborate, but the reason that they, they have them structured the way they are is so that they're open air and you can watch the stars at night. Mm -hmm. And the Hawaiian understanding, the, the ancient Hawaiian understanding of astronomy and astrology rivals that of the Mayans, of the Chinese, the, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Greeks. I mean, it is just amazing. So a lot of these ancient civilizations uh, were so focused on studying the heavens. And, and of course, we've all heard about, you know, ancient astronauts and, you know, did, did aliens from outer space contact people thousands of years ago? And I know that in the scientific community, it's referred to as pseudoscience and pseudo-archaeology. But I think that that too is showing a not so much skepticism, but cynicism to completely dismiss a theory. And we'll, we'll get into to why I feel that way later on. But well, but um, I'm glad that you brought up about the Mayans because they, you know, remember in, um, what was it, 2012 when everyone was like, oh, that's the end of the world. And, and <laughs> it was such a, a misunderstanding. What it was is the Mayan calendar is based on 5,000 year cycles. And that was when the 5,000 year cycle ended and a new one was beginning, but the people who you know, take a half understanding of of um, the Mayan concept of time and of astronomy and of astrology said that the Mayans were predicting the end of times. No, they're predicting the end of time for that calendar. So that's like saying the end of July is the end of the world and, or it's the beginning of August. It depends on how you look at it. <laughs> and then doing a hands across America at the end of July. I don't know if you did that, but I did that here in California. It was a big new age thing where everybody held hands supposedly across the world to create a new world because of what was ending and all of that. Uh, although I think in the metaphysical tribe, we all believed it was the end of that time and yeah. something new was being born. Yeah, well, that's beautiful that you bring that up because, well, two reasons. I speak, and when I speak, I speak about shamanism and extraterrestrials because there's a deep connection there. And I very much address the fact that these really dismissed indigenous actually have had the answers to a lot of things and could solve a lot of the problems here today. And it happens that in December of this year, I'm speaking on a celebrity cruise going specifically to the Yucatan. And we are stopping in Tulum and Woo! Chichen Itza and some of these places you described. And we're going there with some experts who are gonna talk us through like the Hertex, if you don't know who they are, phenomenal scientists. So I'm so excited to hear you say this, Mark, because I'm going there. 
I yeah, you're going to have such, so, I mean, we could do the whole show on the Mayans, but one of the things that just, I get so aggravated um, when I read history, it's like the burning of the library at Alexandria, the sacking of Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade. And when the, the Spanish invaded uh, Central America, the, the zealous um, Catholic missionaries, they took all the Mayan books and burned them. And basically, they they uh, eradicated um, all this knowledge and learning. But there were three sets of what they're called codices, mm -hmm. and they were they're they're like um, it's like a brochure uh, that the way it was structured, but it had the Mayan language in it. And they ended up in European libraries because they were sent as part of the plunder of the Mayans to the court of Spain. And, and one of them ended up in Austria because the Spanish royal family was related to the Austrian royal family. Long story short, it wasn't until in the past about 30, 35 years, there was a teenage boy who was a is a linguistics genius, and he figured out how to read it. So now we at least have some of the myths of their creation stories of the Mayan Mayan language. And at least now the inscriptions on, on the buildings, on the, on the ruins can be read. But the sad part is, according to, to observers, the Spanish burned thousands of these. That would be like burning the Library of Congress to the ground. And it, it, it's the same thing happened in, in the Pacific when zealous missionaries would burn uh, wooden um, plaques. I believe they did this at Easter Island and mm. also in Hawaii. Um, they basically destroyed their language. Mm. Uh, for, for thousands of years, nobody could read Egyptian hieroglyphs until Napoleon invaded Egypt. They found the Rosetta Stone. Mm -hmm. And the Rosetta Stone had three messages on it. One was in Greek. Okay, so scholars could read that. One was in Demiotic, which was a later Egyptian language. It was kind of like a, a cursive shorthand. And the third was in a hieroglyphs. Eventually, the Rosetta Stone made its way to France, once again, plunder. And a linguistics genius by the name of Champillon he figured it out. He saw that the, the the Greek and the Demiotic messages were identical. So logically, the hieroglyph was the same, and he cracked the code. And then, boom, the modern age of Egyptology began because now archaeologists or Egyptologists could read these languages. So deciphering and understanding information, knowledge is precious. Knowledge is as valuable as any any other type of treasure. And the conversation we're having today is about knowledge that comes from beyond this world. Yeah, thank you. That was beautiful. And P.S., you need your own show on Gaia TV. Just saying. Well, I I, <laughs> anyone on Gaia watching this, I've been on Gaia and I welcome the opportunity. Oh my God, I would definitely tune in. Well, let's get to UFOlogy and World UFO Day. So we're actually in UFO month. Why does July host World UFO Day slash month? What, what is that about? And why did they choose July? In 1947, about 75 miles north of Roswell, New Mexico, a rancher by the name of Max uh, Brazel found something really unusual on his ranch. It was a debris field of this really weird metal and supposedly part of a craft. And he took some of the metal samples to the local sheriff who notified the Roswell Army Airfield. At that time, there wasn't a United States Air Force. It was the U.S. Army Air Force. And... All of a sudden, the Roswell Daily Record was the local newspaper broke a story that the army had recovered a flying saucer. So this hit world news and the um, Pentagon stepped in and said, no, it was actually a weather balloon. It was just a crashed weather balloon. Meanwhile, not only did the Pentagon step in, but they quarantined the entire area and confiscated all of the metal, including what had been brought to the sheriff's department. And so it was very, very mysterious as to what happened because the initial stories was, 
uh, the initial story was that this was some type of alien spacecraft, flying saucer, UFO, unidentified flying object. And then the Pentagon said, no, it was a crashed weather balloon. And anyone who studies Roswell, the, the weather balloon story, the government cover-up seems rather ridiculous based on what we now know. Mm -hmm. And you have a story about your father. Is it your father who was an aerospace engineer? Um, I do. Um, about 12 years after Roswell, there was a young aerospace engineer who was invited to a, a, a laboratory in California. He had just attained a top secret security clearance. And they were brought into the laboratory, and he was there with a couple of government officials and the vice president of the company, and they were growing silicon chips. And this was unbelievable, because this would be the greatest leap forward in electronics technology since the invention of the light bulb. At that time, they were using transistors. And transistors, what they did is amplify electric signals. But now they're using something generations, centuries ahead in technology, a silicon chip. And they're growing the silicon chip. And it takes about a month. There's a whole process where in these special conditions, the silicon's actually procreating. And then there's this process whereby it's flattened and, and folded. I mean, the basis of all of our telecommunications, um, silicon chips, all of our computers, our cell phones, our satellite network. And the engineer said, where in the world did we get the idea to do this? And the vice president said, yeah, where in the world? He said, something happened in New Mexico a few years ago, something crashed. And the government brought in all the technology companies and it gave us ideas. And that's all you need to know. And the young engineer's name was Earl, but of course, I knew him as dad. Mm. Oh, my goodness. So how was that for your father? Was well, he allowed to talk about it? How did he share it? How did he process that? Well, he wasn't allowed to talk about it for a very long time. And he told me this when he was in his late 70s. Um, and so he had long retired from from aerospace and he was firmly convinced that UFOs exist. He also saw one one time he was driving and he said he saw this this object that was a, a cluster of three lights and it was doing maneuvers. He said, Mark, I work in aerospace. We don't have anything that can do this. It was doing maneuvers that that he said. Well, and then he, it was moving around. And then it stopped. And then shot straight up and out of out of sight. He goes, I've never seen anything like that. And he said, we don't have any technology that could possibly do this. He also believed that Area 51, um, which you know we all hear about in the news, Area 51, where which is off limits, and that's in Nevada. But also it's the um, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. The story goes... The story goes that there was a crash in Roswell, and not only was an alien spacecraft recovered, but also bodies of the occupants of the spacecraft. And this was confirmed in 2023. There was U.S. congressional hearings about, about UFOs, and David Grush, who was a... Um, an intelligence officer, very high ranking intelligence officer, he said that the United States has recovered non human biologics in addition to a craft. Now, non human biologics, that means a body, all right? Biologics means alive. So when you have somebody with that level of security clearance and credibility, Plus, also at the hearing, they had a number of F-18 pilots. All right, these guys are top gun. We've probably all seen the movie. I love I love the movie uh, Top Gun. I like the sequel. I thought the sequel was great, too. But the thing is, top gun pilots are about as serious and credible a person as you can meet. These are not just pilots. Pilots are amazing as it is. 
but these are the best of the best. And for years, there has been footage of, of um, these pilots trying to track and follow things that move at speeds that exceed anything we have. They said the same thing my dad uh, said, they can perform maneuvers that our vest, um, that our aircraft can't. And then they're also saying they're zipping along and then they go in the ocean because a number of them have been filmed um, off of Virginia Beach, which is is the, um, you know, the headquarters of, of our Navy, our main naval base there. So when you start, and, and former Navy pilot Ryan Graves testified, if everyone could see the sensor and video data I witnessed, our national conversation would change. The American people deserve to know what is happening in our skies. It is long overdue. So now we have some extremely credible people on record before the United States Congress, which at one time I would say it was a very reputable organization. <laughs> but um, And I think for the most part it is. I mean, there's a few colorful individuals that have sullied its reputation. But the, the truth of the matter is the United States Congress is not conducting hearings on UFOs because they think it's fun. They certainly have a lot of very important things to do, but this is important enough. It, it goes even further too, Debbie, because other countries, supposedly Russia, and I understand uh, there was a similar type of crash in Great Britain um, some years back. So it is theoretically possible the Russians have also recovered uh, an alien spacecraft. And I guess it goes to show that they may come from light years away and, and distances away, but they're, they're, they're not infallible because they crash, you know, but which, and, and there could be a lot of reasons why that happens. But for, for at least the past 75 to 80 years, starting with the Roswell incident, there have been documented accounts of encounters with what is believed to be extraterrestrial, meaning outside of planet Earth, um, some type of vehicles. And according to this government official, we've even reco recovered the bodies of them. So I think this is extremely fascinating. Yeah, it is fascinating. And I had Nick Pope. I don't know if you know who he is from uh, Ancient Aliens uh, on the show in December. And he used to work for the British government specifically on UFO material. Uh, he's a fascinating fellow, very nice. And he said in December, early December of last year, that by the end of this year, that year, and going into this year, the whistleblowers are going to come forward way more. They're not scared anymore. They're not going to back down anymore. And they're more encouraged than ever because of the reception of the public, right? So if this information is so important. And I think between where we are now and the lies we've been fed and where we're headed, which I hope it's incumbent that we're heading into connection undeniable first open contact. I mean, we've had throughout history contact. Everybody knows that, I think who's watching the show, but I'm talking about where planet earth and humanity knows. And I think the beautiful way to prepare us for that benevolent contact with these advanced beings is that we start to know the truth. So people aren't so freaked out and afraid when they do come. I've never understood what the what the 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 government's motivation would be for covering this up, and I I'm sure they have legitimate reasons. Uh, the general idea is it would cause worldwide panic. Right. Well, could the world possibly be in a more <laughs> panic and, and disastrous state than it is? It's so true. I mean, it, it it's pathetic the way humanity. The one thing we have perfected is, is our ability to destroy and to kill. Um, I mean, with our nuclear arsenals all around the world, um, humans have the capability of wiping out life on this planet. And I think that's extremely depressing. And other people say, well, if these aliens are, you know, why don't they just contact us? I would imagine this is strictly my thought that why would they? If they're observing us, we're an incredibly violent species we pollute our oceans, our air, we deforest. We're constantly in a state of warfare. 
if they've been observing us for extended periods of time, they also realize any technology that they would give us, we would immediately find a way to weaponize it. You know, maybe I'm sounding facetious here, but it, I mean, humanity doesn't make a very good case for itself. I mean, our history, um, concentration camps, mass executions. I mean, right now what's going on all over the world, I don't want to get political, but I mean, um, it, it's just it's always this violence and this destruction. The other thing about, about extraterrestrials observing us, people say, well, they're going to come and take over. I mean, you know, Independence Day, that, that uh, movie, which I thought was ridiculous because you have these aliens come and we're able to foil them because of um, a glitch we do on Windows 95. Okay, so, so these aliens that are coming from thousands of light years away are using Windows 95, and we we don't even use Windows 95 anymore. But but le leaving all joking aside, um, if they were truly hostile, I think we'd know it by now. Obviously, if they have the technological capability of traversing distances that we can't even begin to comprehend, they would have done so and and uh, invaded us. So they appear to be observing, perhaps extracting things, um, maybe natural resources, maybe biological material for various reasons. Or they may be looking at us with about as much interest as we would look at an anthill. Ants are very organized. They have armies. They make wars on different types of ants. They, they build their hills and they're looking at us going, well, these creatures, they're very organized, albeit warlike. And there may be as much of a difference between these aliens and us as between humans and an anthill. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And two things I'd like to say about what you just shared with us. The first thing is I have hope because so many of us are waking up. So many who are being born are truly rainbow children. They come incredibly gifted, way more, certainly than my generation or even the generation before or after me. And so there's a lot of hope there. And on the other side, I completely concur with what you just said, Mark, because this is, I think, projection at its finest, shadow work at its finest. Humans putting on an extraterrestrial and saying, you're going to do to me what I would do to you. So I would cook you and eat you. I would kill you. I would take over. I would go after all your resources. I would steal your technology and do something crappy with it. And that's total projection because an advanced race doesn't even understand that mentality. And they certainly have no interest in it. You know, earlier when we were talking about the minds, the perfect thing that you just said, this is a good segue back to that. The Mayans, the, the Native Americans, but let's focus on the Mayans and the Aztecs. They have an advanced civilization. They're able to build incredible stone structures. They understand math and science and all this. And all of a sudden, alien craft, which were galleons, these big sailing ships that the Mayans didn't have anything like this. I mean, they had boats and they had ships and you know, they had sails, but nothing like the technology of the air age of discovery from Europe, then the beings that emerge from it have this incredible destructive capability. They have gunpowder, they have cannons. And the Mayans and the Aztecs especially were horrified of mounted Spanish soldiers because they thought that this was some type of animal human monster. They didn't realize that the horses were separate from from the, the Spanish soldiers, at least initially. It was like some type of centaur type of creature. Wow. Mm. Okay. Then um, they had armor. So basically there was a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel. And in the Spanish then, of course, without meaning to, at least at first, infected the Native Americans within 10 years. Excuse me, within 20 years of the Native uh, of the Europeans in, in incurring Upon Central America, 90% of the population, of the Native American population, died because of European diseases, um, smallpox, um, the flu, 
Um, but if if uh, the Native Americans got back, they were able to give them gonorrheas, which they brought back to uh, to Europe. But but the thing is, the technological disparity between the Mayans and the Aztecs, who technologically were probably on a level of about the Romans, but now here's in a, a civilization a thousand years more advanced that has steel, that has gunpowder, that has all types of weapons, all types of navigational equipment. And then the Spanish started engaging in biological warfare because what they would do, and I know that they did this in Florida, um, bodies that had been wrapped, but people that had died from smallpox, they would wrap their bodies in blankets and then they would take those blankets minus the bodies right mm -hmm. leave them for native americans along with food mm -hmm. and other things so it would infect them right by the time the spanish reached peru um pizarro the conquistador who invaded peru um the incan army was about a hundred thousand men against about 300 spanish but the incan army was so sick they could barely stand, let alone fight. So disease was sweeping through. And that's a human mentality. Like you, very uh, in a very enlightened way, as always, Debbie, you pointed out that, that these beings from another world don't have that type of mentality. Apparently, conquering Earth is, is not their objective. Because if it had been, I think it would have already happened. Agreed. Exactly. They're that advanced. They would have done it already. And I, I really agree. And thank you for that. That's beautiful. Some of that history. It's ugly, but it's a beautiful analogy to what's happening. And you're talking also about advanced technology. That's pretty fascinating. There is a warp drive out there. And yeah. you'll have to help me if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Al Kubier. And it's known as faster than life travel, hyperspace, right? This is yeah, Star it, Trek it, kind of stuff. The Alcubera metric. Alcubera. Okay. okay. Alcubera is a Mexican physicist in, within the past 20 years. And he theorized that we can create a warp drive. Let me back up a bit. Albert Einstein, one mm -hmm. of my heroes, um, his theory of relativity states that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Light travels at 186,282 miles per second. Now that's pretty darn fast. But when you look at the closest star to us is Alpha Centauri, and that's four light years away. That means you would have to be going 186,282 miles per second for four years mm -hmm. nonstop to get there. All right. Voyager and Voyager 2 have traveled roughly a light minute. We're still getting messages back from them. We launched those back in the 70s. Incredible pictures of Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, the outer planets, and now they've left our solar system, and that is a light minute, okay? So that's... Yes, it's far for us, but not very far for, for human beings. I mean, uh, for for space. So let's say these aliens, they're not coming from Alpha Centauri. Let's say they're coming from a thousand light years away. How do they do it? According to Einstein, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. So even if they invented a, a, a light speed engine propulsion system, it would take a thousand years to get here. However, time and space can be folded and warped. And Al Kubera said, if you have a vessel in space and you generate a sufficient energy field around it, you create a curvature in the space-time continuum. So take this piece of paper. Here is planet Earth. Here's the aliens a thousand light years away. They may have the technological capability of generating this warp bubble, which in, in the paper is the space-time continuum. So they're not exceeding the speed of light. They're folding it 
So you jump from one coordinate in space time to another instantaneously. So Einstein's theory of relativity isn't violated, but he also talked about because the faster you go, time seems to change. And so you create this warp bubble, so you're not exceeding the speed of light, you're merely jumping from one coordinate to the next using an energetic field. Physicists around the world have said, yes, this is feasible, but we can't, we don't have the technology to do this yet. Now it gets even better. The warp bubble, according to the theorist, must, it will not be generated from the vessel, but from something beyond it. In other words, something else has to create the warp bubble for it to go through. So that would mean like a sophisticated system of, of like launch gates, uh, I guess, in space. Now, several of the UFOologists I've spoken to, including um, Dr. Colonel Dr. John Alexander, he was the former head of the U.S. military's um, UFO project. He said the theory is this is not a tin can flying through space for a thousand years. And the Alcubera metric, which, which we just uh, talked about and I described, appears to be how they do this. Now, this is really fascinating because of my work as a medium. I believe that interdimensional communication, which is what I do, communicating with spirits, and interdimensional travel, um, there are different entities using a similar energetic modality to jump from one dimension to the next. You know, and as a medium yourself, okay, we're talking to spirits and, you know, people think that heaven, the afterlife, it's some distant, distant um, destination, when in reality, it's like the other side's FM radio, our, our world, material world is AM radio. There are two different dimensions, yet they can overlap. There's an energetic link, or rather a warp between them. Taking that and extrapolating it to what we're talking about, it's the same thing with UFOs. That, once again, it's not a tin can flying through space. They have the capability to create an energetic field which causes the time-space continuum to fold so they can jump from one, one coordinate in space-time to another. 100%. And I I just had this feeling as you were speaking when you brought up that you are a medium, a psychic medium. And I, I thought, my God, have has he ever done a reading for somebody looking for the beloveds or anyone who's around them? And all of a sudden, it is a being from another incarnation in another galaxy. In other words, have you ever done a reading for somebody and an extraterrestrial showed up? Well, I've done readings for people who claim to have been abducted by aliens. And um, I've done several of those readings. The most famous abductee I did a reading for, his name was Calvin Parker. In October of 1973, 19-year-old Calvin Parker um, blew off the day from work, and he was with a family friend, 42-year-old Charles Hickson, and they're in Pascagoula, Mississippi, and they were fishing near a, you know, like an old uh, shipyard. And he said, you know, and, and I, I loved Calvin, and I considered him a friend. We used to talk on the phone quite a bit after um, after I uh, uh, initially interviewed him for a podcast I was working on. And, and he said, here we were, two good old boys fishing, and all of a sudden, this thing came out of the sky, about 100 foot long. It looked like silver, kind of shaped like a football. And he said, we were terrified. We wanted to run, but we couldn't. This white light that, that the, the, the vessel shot at them hit them and they were paralyzed. They couldn't move. He goes, then these three ugly looking things came out of it. They look like robots with these big uh, crab-like pinchers. And they grabbed these two guys and brought them on board the vessel. He says, I don't know what happened to Charles. They took him in one direction, took me in another. And he said, and there was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen who seemed to be their commander. He said she was gorgeous. And he said, but one weird thing is when she held up her hand, the two middle fingers looked like something you'd see on some type of, of reptile, you know, and, he, and she made these croaking sounds. It could sound like a bullfrog or even an alligator. And she would communicate with the robotic things. And they went up against the walls. 
Meanwhile, he was injected with something. He said it felt like a sedative. And this device came out of the ceiling. They put him on what it looked like an uh, examination table, and it began scanning him. And I said, how did you feel? And he said, like a lab rat. And he said, um, he, he was absolutely terrified. He said, but that woman, he goes, if she'd been at a bar, I would have gone up and talked to her. He goes, the fingers were a little bit weird, but, you know, hey, you know, <laughs> but he was funny. He had a good sense of humor. And afterwards, he said, when they were done with him, um, these robotics dumped he and uh, Charles right back where they had um, taken them. Now, these guys were in a state of shock. They were horrified. I mean, how do you even comprehend this? And they said, we can't tell anyone about this, anyone about this. Well, they went to the sheriff's department and the sheriffs, um, they brought in a doctor and they found all these weird puncture marks all over both their bodies. It wasn't disclosed until years later, because this was the early 70s and, and it was unfortunate that it wasn't. But the sheriff's department in Pascagoula, Mississippi that day was flooded with phone calls from people reporting flying saucers. So now we know. Okay. I said, well, did you make a lot of money off this? Get famous? He goes, Mark, this was two weeks before I was supposed to get married. He goes, you don't get famous off of saying you've been abducted by aliens from a flying saucer. And he goes, and the way my in-laws were looking at me, he goes, it was horrible. Now, Charles, on the other hand, um, Charles Hickson, he went on, he was on The Tonight Show, and he became kind of a, a TV celebrity, the guy that was abducted by aliens. Calvin didn't like the media attention. But they were both considered the most credible alien abductees on record, they were subjected to hypnotherapy, truth serum, sodium pentothal, lie detector tests, polygraphs, um, all types of interrogation for over 50 years, and neither one of them ever came up as deceptive. So from all objective accounts, it appears that they were telling the truth. Then Calvin confided in me that 20 years later, he was in his truck, and he goes, and I, he goes, I couldn't believe it. There it was again. There was that shiny object and the white light. I couldn't move. And the robotic things, they pulled me out of my truck, brought me on board. And he goes, and there she was. And he said, and I was mad. He goes, I was so mad. I didn't want to go through it. He goes, I shoved her as hard as I could. And he said, and when I did, he said that I saw what she really was. It was like some type of projection over her. It, it, um, it, it. It, it uh, blurred, and he said this reptile-like creature, and then the image of the beautiful woman formed over, and he goes, they were doing some type of projection so that I wouldn't be afraid. They figured out, like, the most beautiful woman I'd be attracted to. He said, but when I shoved her, those robot things grabbed me, they roughed me up, they injected me with something, next thing I knew, I was back in my truck. Then after that, his health started declining seriously, and he died of cancer, almost 50 years to the day um, back in October of, of 2023. Um, so he had been abducted at least twice. Now, I did a reading for Calvin and um, Charles Hickson had since died. His spirit came through. Um, loved ones from Calvin came through and they were explaining uh, things about why he had been targeted. I also was doing a, a gallery event where um, there was about 100 people in the audience, and there was this young man I was drawn to, and he was like this real buff young guy, um, perfect jawline, black hair, real muscular. Like we were talking about Top Gun. He looked like Tom Cruise in the first Top Gun movie. His grandfather's spirit came through and started talking about the greys. And I said, the greys come and get you. That's what your grandfather's saying. This young man bursts into tears, starts shaking. He goes, they won't leave me alone. They keep coming for me and doing experiments. And he goes, how can I get it to stop? And his grandfather's spirit said, there's something. It's about how you metabolize protein. It makes you interesting to them. You have to change your diet. I could go on and on and on, Debbie, but um, I did another reading for Nancy Tremaine 
also consider one of the most credible abductees on record. She was a little girl in Michigan, and in front of the whole neighborhood, including the police, this object came out of the sky and abducted her. And she said the most handsome man she'd ever seen. And, and it was the same thing. It was a, there, in other words, it was a, another reptilian type of creature. But the greys that abducted this young man, I'm going to call him Tom, um, it appears based on uh, the UFOologist and that there are more than one species coming to Earth. So... I was talking to Chris DiPerno, and Chris DiPerno used to be a police um, um, detective and investigator, and he didn't believe in UFOs or anything, but in the state of New York, he started um, debriefing people who claimed that they had been abducted. He now is the head of MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, in the state of New York, and he for a long time was their lead investigator. He left police work to do this, and I was talking to him, and he's a very extremely credible guy. And the cool thing about MUFON, I've met a lot of the people in MUFON. These are not a bunch of wonky, nerdy geeks. These are scientists. These are investigators. These are astronomers. These are extremely credentialed and credible people. And I told him about in the different readings I've done, the protein issue always comes up. And he said, what did you say? He said, Mark, every abductee that we debrief, they have this insatiable craving for protein. One guy, he said, was, was so hungry, he ripped open a package of hot dogs raw and wolfed down the whole thing in front of us. So then I contacted Calvin and I said, Calvin, what's with the, um, do, you, do you ever have any cravings for protein? He goes, oh my God, I can't get enough of it. Bacon, sausage, hamburger, steak. He goes, I just can't get enough of protein. So I was talking to Chris again, Chris DiPerno from MUFON. And he said, Mark, I can't believe that you're doing readings for these people and the spirits of their loved ones are talking about protein as the marker. That appears to be why some people are targeted and some people are not. It has to do with protein, protein metabolization. So the question, Debbie, why are they looking for these genetic markers? And if they're doing probes and taking samples from these people, what are they doing with these cells that they're harvesting? Mm -hmm. Well, good question. Well, uh, the protein thing. So if this is a marker, a genetic marker, then changing their diet, you mentioned, was one way potentially out of it. What would they change their diet to? Would they become vegan? Would they stay completely away from protein? How would that work? I, I think it would be reduce the amount of protein so it's not so much in your body. You know, MUFON, at least what, what Chris and I were talking about, could they be harvesting these cells strictly out of scientific curiosity, or could this be some type of human-alien hybridization program? And I know this sounds very X-Files. No, I mean, I I interview people who channel extraterrestrials, this is real. And I think many of us know that even the hybridization program, it's huge. The greys do it. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's how the Sasani from the Sasani planet were created. That's how the Yayels were created and many other races. And there are many people on this earth that I meet when I speak at conferences who will say, I am a hybrid. They have awareness. They're not fully from here that they had a, for instance, and I used to have a client, she was, <clears throat> pardon me, her father was Arcturian, her mother was earth-based, and they had a pact, they had a baby, it was this person, and she is here to help the ascension process on earth right now, and she's completely in touch with her father's spacecraft at all times, and I believe her, when you meet her, you know this person is not 100% human. It's very evident. So this doesn't sound wild to me at all. But I am curious, 
So reptilians, that makes sense. And, you know, look, there's good singers, bad singers, good plumbers, bad plumbers, good reptilians, bad reptilians. They have a bad rap, but they're not all bad. These ones don't sound very nice um, or compassionate. Do you think or know when speaking to Calvin, if he had any sense, were there Dracos? Because that's a whole nother level of malevolence. Or were they reptilian? Did he know? Well, he, he felt they were um, reptiles, uh, rep reptilian. And, um, oh, I got one, one other thing. I was doing a reading for this woman and her son. And during the reading, you know, their, the spirits of their loved ones came through. And all of a sudden I said, they're showing me a UFO. It's like it came near you and then left. And she, she and her son were like freaking out. They said, oh, my God. We, they were out somewhere outside at night. And they said, we saw this UFO and it hit us with a light and then it left. And the message from their spirits was you were close, but not close enough for what they were looking for. So apparently they have an ability to scan particular people. And it does appear that they abduct the same people multiple times. Like Nancy Tremaine said that she's been abducted a number of times. She's a very sweet woman. Um, and the and the problem is when you go public and I mean, I know what it's like when when I went public and I was an attorney. I, I mean, I am an attorney, but I was practicing at the time, you know, with with my ability to communicate with spirits and how I was dragged through the mud, and the media and people making fun of me and and still to this day. But when you say that you've been abducted by aliens from um, a UFO, a flying saucer, or an extraterrestrial craft. Uh, it it is a brutal life. I mean, Calvin said it was terrible. It was absolutely horrible. But I asked him. I said, Calvin, why do you think they're coming here? And I want to read exactly what he said. He said, Lord, who knows? Maybe to keep us from self destructing. This whole world is getting so bad. Aren't we on a collision course to destroy ourselves? Somebody or something has got to intervene. I think there's going to be a day when they come to make their purpose here known. So he said, yeah, he didn't appreciate them and all that, but he also didn't feel that they were overtly malevolent. But he did say he felt like a lab rat. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Incredible. And so the things, the after effects, so the need for protein and also having a protein marker, this craving of the meat after the experience, and you just mentioned public scorn and some rejection. What are there? Are there other commonalities with abductees? Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder. In, in when we think of PTSD, we normally think of military personnel, but the thing is, everybody to some extent suffers from some form of PTSD. If you've ever been there when a loved one has died, God forbid you see like a child, your child run over by a car or killed somehow, that is, is post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, if you are coping with some type of terrible disease or, or some type of loss, there's, there's different degrees of it. But post-traumatic stress disorder is is um, a very big component. And I've found in dealing with the with the abductees that their behavior and feelings in the aftermath parallels those of rape victims. But well, think about it. It's a violation. Mm -hmm. These things are taking you against your will, sticking stuff all in your body and in all types of places. Um, family rejection. What? You're out of your mind. You're you're crazy. Public scorn. Um, Calvin said, "You don't get rich telling people you got abducted by aliens from a flying saucer." He said, "Yeah, I wrote a book, but he donated most of the money that he made on the book to charity, so he wasn't there to cash in on it. But it is it's it it is extremely traumatic." It creates all types of social and familial rejection. It gives you all types of feelings um, of violation that ties into the PTSD. Um, the people that go forward with it, once again, you're putting yourself out there and you get attacked for, for your beliefs. So it is, it is not 
it is not a pleasant experience. I mean, I always thought it'd be fascinating, you know, because I'd probably be trying to communicate with them, but they may be looking at me as like, what is this primitive creature attempting to communicate with us? Mm -hmm. So they may not be real interested in anything we have to say or much less what we think. Yeah. Okay. That's so interesting. Uh, I hear so many stories. They're all incredibly different about people's experiences on board ship. But I'm thinking about one, as you mentioned, the PTSD and some of the after effects. And there are many women out there who have been pregnant with hybrid children, and then they've been brought aboard the spacecraft not to full term, not to full nine months, sometimes a four months, and then they are opened, not in a horrible way like they would do here. Right. But they have their own technology. They remove the fetus, and then the mother is sent back to live her life. And some of them are then brought back to the ship many years later, sometimes decades later, and they get to meet their children. I can't imagine. I was born under the sun sign of cancer. You don't get any more home-based, loyal, family-based than that. And I cannot imagine meeting someone, half alien, half human, doesn't matter to me, half animal, half human. That's my baby, you know? Yeah. I would want to stay connected, but they don't. They just get to nurture that child a little bit, I guess, genetically and somehow emotionally give it what it needs at that stage. And then there's that separation and they go back and often they never see that child again. Wow. Well, once again, PTSD, I mean, and grief, <clears throat> grief, losing a child. I mean, if you're pregnant and these things take that baby out of you. Yeah. You know, I, I, for people who are not familiar with Debbie and, and me, I know how this sounds. Look, I used to be a senior partner of a law firm. All right. Everything has to be credible, fact-based. But I, I, I left that in the rear view so that I can pursue my, my interest in the afterlife and paranormal investigation. And there is a universe and multiverses of things we can't even begin to understand or comprehend. And assuming that if we can't see it, it's not real, when NASA said that over 90% of the universe is dark matter, meaning we can't see or perceive with the five physical senses of sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch, 90% of the universe is beyond our perception. Who's to say that these people who have had these experiences are not telling 100% truth? I'm firmly convinced Calvin Parker was telling the truth. Hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, I don't know either what they're creating. And it makes me wonder, hearkening back to what we said earlier, Mark, when we talked about what's going on in the planet. And you said it so eloquently with the deforestation and the pollution of the sky and the waters and all the wars, et cetera. You know, it's, it's very heinous. And then there's also a lot of people who are beautiful and contributing and and somehow I hope that that changes like what you see in law, your symbol. I hope that changes. And the really beautiful light beings, the light workers who are here start to shed more light and the darkness goes away even more because it could be that we're going to need a, a new humanity that's being created because ours isn't doing such a great job. And perhaps that's part of the hybridization program. I don't know. Or maybe they're populating they, other channel, other uh, planets. I hope they hurry up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, only time will tell. And then again, they may never reveal why they're here. Maybe they're collecting these cells for things that involve them um, as opposed to us. So, we well, that could be, I want to say, you know, that's part of the Greys agenda because the Greys literally neutered themselves at some point in their evolution. They decided, listen, emotions, puh, 
Like who needs them? They actually lead to things like what's going on on earth. Why don't we wipe those out? So literally over generations, they extracted all the emotions out of themselves and they became like uncaring robots. And they realized they were going extinct. They were not going to continue unless something happened to them. And they started to re-engender some emotions back into them. So a lot of their hybridization program with humans and creating the hybrids is to bring emotions back in. So half gray, half human, and that's creating a whole new population. So I, I believe strongly in that, I, that there's probably great research going on and great reason for many of them why they're doing what they're doing. It's just a shame that sometimes it's done so roughly and to frighten people. Yeah. Um, it would be nice if they could communicate with us, but I'm. they obviously have their reasons why they don't. Or maybe, once again, getting all x files -y, maybe they are in contact with various people or governments on Earth. Who knows? But, you know, when it comes to UFOs, the question is, who is watching who? You know, we're looking for them. Maybe they're seeing us. But it just certainly adds to the mystery of life and life without mysteries and things to explore and to investigate isn't much of a life at all. So Debbie, I want to thank you so much for having me on your show and I look forward to next time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Again, maybe we'll do another one next year on the Mayans. I have really appreciated this and folks as we are at the end. If you'd like to check out Mark Anthony, go to afterlifefrequency.com. I end today's show with this quote from Michael Harner. What's really important about shamanism is that there is another reality that you can personally discover. We are not alone. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, your weekly Dare to Dream podcast leave a comment and share. And next week on the show, I am speaking with Sylvie Sterling. She is the author of The Cat Secret, international speaker and channel of The Cat Collective, and she is a Lyran starseed. Thank you so much for joining us today on Dare to Dream.